<laughs> All right, well, I'm glad you're here. We're going to continue our study in hermeneutics, and um, hopefully at the end of whatever time we spend, I don't know how long it'll be, it won't be too long, that you'll have some really good tools in your interpretive chest or your tool belt to approach the Word of God and, and have um, a little more confidence in knowing that how you're reading is correct. So let me pray, and then we'll, we'll do a very, very brief review and, uh, and then get to some of the axioms. Let me pray first. Father, we thank you so much that you've instructed us on how to interpret your word. Um, we're very thankful that you've given us your word, that you have spoken to us, that it is truly transcendent revelation that only comes from you. Um, and there is no other revelation like it. And we're so thankful that you have, even in your word, told us how we might approach it, we might understand it, and then we might live in accordance with it by the power of your spirit. Um, I pray, Lord, as I have these past two sessions, that tonight you would uh, be present with us, that we might enjoy this time of community in worship through your spirit, um, that you might help us to think even at this late hour of the day, Father, that you might make our minds fertile, um, and in so doing, we can retain some of these things. Um, we don't want to just understand them tonight and then forget about them tomorrow. We want to incorporate them in how we approach your word on a daily basis. So help us to that end, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Okay, so that beautiful fancy term of, come on, Brandon, don't, don't let me down here. Uh, okay. All right. Brandon got me a clicker. Isn't that nice? Now I feel really important. The power of the clicker. <laughs> I know. How long? How long, Myrna? You know how long? Seriously, years. You're like, hey, change the slide. Now we're... We had a clicker at one time, and then it broke, I guess, and then we never replaced it. <laughs> that's right that's true all right so if you if you're a really good student i'll let you use the clicker too okay that'll be your bonus all right myrna does not get it okay uh hermeneutics how many of you heard the term hermeneutics before you started studying hermeneutics with us in this last few weeks Raise your hand if you've heard that term before. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. You do it all the time. You, everybody has a hermeneutic. It's how we approach Scripture. So you're, you're using a means or rules to interpret God's Word. Um, so I gave you the de definition in the first week. Hermeneutics is the theory and methodology of interpretation. Rules and principles used to interpret Scripture. Methods used to accurately convey a message that can be clearly understood. So biblical hermeneutics is how the scriptures teach us to interpret the scriptures. And some will argue, and we'll look at this a little bit later, that it's circular reasoning, right? That you're using the scriptures to interpret scripture, which is, makes sense because we believe it to be the word of God, right? Um, but we're going we're gonna to hold on to that because um, there's no better means of instructing us on how to interpret the word of God than the word of God itself, right? Okay, so we started off last time with a passage, and I want to do the same tonight. Um, every single time you approach a, a verse or a passage or a chapter or a book in the Bible, you are using some interpretive lens. You are how you were trained in the home, how you were trained in the church. Maybe you weren't trained at all, but you've incorporated just certain things of how you approach literature. And so what I'd like you to do, uh, read to yourself, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39, um, a, a compelling passage by our Lord. And then I want you to do two things for me. I want you to interpret it incorrectly, and then I want you to interpret it correctly. And then I want you to tell me how you know your correct interpretation is in fact correct. Okay? So interpret it incorrectly, then correctly, and tell me how you know it's correct.
one of the thir- first things you should be demanding of me is context. You say, I will not interpret that unless you give me the rest of the passage. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth, to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves a son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's do some really... So this is a very popular verse used by those who either do not believe the scriptures or think that this is a perfect example of how Christian teaching is hate-filled. So let's do bad hermeneutics first. What does this literally say? You don't have to get creative. Tell me what it says. Hate your family and love me. Give me some interpretive aspects to this too. As you tell me what it says, then give me some wrong interpretation. So this, this Jesus fellow, uh, he, he came to make war. And part of that's true, and part of it's not true, if you interpret it from a secular perspective. What else? Oh, come on, there's tons up here you can get wrong. I mean, there's just, really? You have, you have five verses and it's so much. Divisive, yes. Christ, div, division in the family. This man wants our families divided against each other. I mean, doesn't he say a man against his father, a daughter against his mother? Sarah? Yeah, literally. Yeah, you're going to get really literal on me, huh? All right, good. What else? <laughs> he is. He's desperate, right? He's desperate. He's selfish. He's egocentric. He's glory starved to the point where he will bring war and divide our families unless he gets love first and foremost. A message of hate. A message of hate. Oh, and that's, that's what it's argued. Good. That's fantastic. Yeah. So here's here's the trick in, right? Verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You find it by doing these things. Good. Well, we're excellent at getting this wrong. And yet, all we're doing is reading it. None of you have done anything but said, well, this is what it says. And we don't want to say, be very careful, we don't want to say that's not what it says. We want to say that is what it says, but this is what it means. Okay? So hermeneutics is the process of interpretation. Right? Two people reading these verses can come away with very different interpretations using the exact same words. Tina. Sure. Yep. Yeah, much more subtle, right? Even more dangerous. Yeah. Even more dangerous. Okay, so then help me out. Since you have just decimated my faith, I am now, I have no idea what to do for the rest of my life. Please set me straight. What does this actually say? You say, well, we just told you what it said. Does it say? What does it mean? 
If it doesn't mean the things that you just said it meant, even though that's exactly what it says, then what does it mean? You pause too long here and you're going to scare me, Debbie. Good. Okay. So it certainly establishes the supremacy of Christ in his relationship to those who profess his name. Good. Brandon. So, Brandon, doing his good hermeneutics, he knows that context is king. We're not going to understand these passages really at all. We're, we could even guess correctly, but we're not going to know them outside of the context, right? So we want to go back into the text itself. We want to read back. We want to read forward. We can say, okay, this was the scene, right? It's a gospel, so it's narrative. In this context, he's teaching in narrative fashion, and therefore we have rules that we need to play by. Good. And so this is, not, this is not Jesus commanding us to have hatred in our family or to hate our mother and father. It is the persecution that will come, the cost involved of following him and truly loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Which, of course, in a, as a Jewish audience, they knew that was the first and greatest commandment. Right? So they're going to be far less shocked than we would as Westerners. Excellent. What else? Good. So when he uses a narrative of even hating your father and your mother, I mean, that was so far out there. Correct. Uh, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly a, right. Exclamation mark behind the, you know, the conversion to Christ and what that may mean for you. Good. That's right. So the, the family in the first century Mediterranean culture was first, right? Parents and siblings. And so for, for Christ to use these individuals to say, I must supersede, your love for me must supersede even the family structure, which would have been supreme, would have been completely countercultural. Not so much you're right today. If you say, well, I don't like my parents much anyway, and I don't like my brothers and sisters. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so um, help me here. How do you know, Debbie, what you said, and Brandon and Mark, how do you know you're right? How do you know we weren't right the first time? Okay. So we're going to argue narrative. We're going to use biblical theology. So you're right. So when we talk about, you talked about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He must be first, right? We see the supremacy of God from Genesis to Revelation. That's theme. So you're going to go back into the scripture and say, this is how I know I'm right. Good. What about you, Brandon? What are you going to hang your hat on? Okay. So the Good. 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 Okay, so you'll go directly to the passage and you'll argue the rules of narrative. Good. So we can find cost of discipleship in other passages, right? We can find the division the gospel brings in other passages. Mark, what about, what about you? You're going to have to go out a little bit more, aren't you, with your comment? You're going to have to go out to some extra biblical teachings in order to get an understanding of, let's say, the, the sociological family structure of a Jewish home in the first century. But you can do that. And when you do that, you're going to go, wow, this really this lends itself to this teaching even more. So each of us, we're, we're, we're actually using tools to render a correct decision. We're not just reading that and saying, a reader response theory is, 
That's what it says. This is what I think it means. It means what I want it to mean because it's me, right? I mean, that's what we're taught today is that just what you think it means is what it means, right? Rather than doing that, we're actually using a lot of interpretive rules, many of which we will identify here, but you're already doing, right? You're talking about the, what's called the analogy of faith or sola scriptura going back. You're using contextualization. Mark, you're using historical sociology and history. And all those are tools we want to come and, and, and um, bring meaning into the text. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Marissa. Yep. No. Sola Scriptura is always first, but all Scripture, we're going to talk about this tonight, all Scripture is written historically. So you have real people writing to other real people in time, right? So we always want to use what's called the grammatical historical method. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but the history is really important. I, I need to have an understanding of you know, what when Jesus is speaking to disciples, what was a disciple in the first century? What does that even look like? What does it mean to follow a teacher? Um, what, was, what was the importance of a son to father and daughter to mother in that first century context? So all those things will, will give meaning to the text, but they won't define or interpret the text, right? They help us understand. Really, really important though. And a lot, of our, a lot of our interpretive errors are due in part to failing, fa- in failing to have a good historical understanding. What we do, very common, we take our history, 2021 Silicon, 2022, there you go, lose a whole year, 2022 Silicon Valley, and we slam it onto the first century text. We do that all the time. And then we interpret it that way. So we, we want to have as much good history, and it has to be good history, um, in order to help fill in some of these blanks. Now that being said, the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to interpret it correctly even if we don't have that. Yeah, but it's sure helpful, sure refines it a bit, okay? Okay, so passages like this you've come across probably in your, earlier in your faith when you first read it, you probably thought, mm, wow, wow, that really, was that, what is he saying? That's hard, right? And then you, you, you spend a little bit of time thinking about it, praying about it, doing a little bit of studying, like, oh, I know what, he, I know what he's saying, right? Um, and so on passages like this, don't skip by them. Hard passages, spend time working on them because you're going to get, you know, if you're sharing the gospel, and this was one of my students' favorite. They had a handful. This was a huge one. You know, are you telling me that, that your Savior tells me that I need to hate my father or that I need to love him most? And usually goes back, sending to what you said, there, there's a, a desire to paint Christ as some egomaniac that needs attention and love, right? And that, we understand that. They, they, they're going to come after Christ, okay? Okay, good, very good. Okay, so basics about the book. We talked about this last time. Um, can't read those bottom two, it's required and trustworthy. Uh, these were 10 just real basic aspects about the Bible that if you have, if you have all 10 and you keep them on you as you're studying the Word of God, they're going to help you from deviating from that narrow gospel path. Um, so we believe that it is, when we say God's Word, we mean that it is God's Word, literally, divinely inspired, um, and therefore. What's the interpretive understanding of that? If it is God's word, what is, how does that impact our interpretation? Truth. That it's truth. It's infallible. It cannot be wrong, right? Yes, good. Um, I put diverse, diverse up here I, because I didn't know how to categorize the second one if you took notes on it. The Bible, we know, multiple books, multiple authors, 1,500 years, so there's complexity to it, which is why we do hermeneutics, because we want to be able to understand if we're in poetry or wisdom or prophecy or history, we want to know how to approach that. So there's diversity to it, and yet we also believe it is completely unified, right? It's unified in its purpose, it's unified in its theology, right? So we don't have scripture pitted against itself, 
We believe that it is powerful. How powerful is the word of God? Able to what? Bone and marrow, right? It's able to transform the human heart, to go deep, to convict, to encourage, to empower. We believe that it's understandable. Do you remember that great little theological term that I gave you? It starts with a P. P-E-R. P-R-S. <laughs> Perspicuity. <laughs> remember? Perspicuity. That means it's understandable. It's approachable. You can get a hold on it. Um, revelatory. This is really important. The only place that you can get God speaking to man is the Word of God. That's it, right? So it is revelatory in that God communicates to us through His Word. It is practical. You say, well, of course. It is truthful. It is required. How, when, remember we talked about that? How is it required? You said it's required for a test, or what does that mean? Yes, in part. So it's God's communication to mankind. You are mankind. You are required to know God's word. Saved or unsaved, actually, remember? Jesus is going to use the word of God, the double-edged sword of his mouth. We saw it with Thyatira. He's going to use his words to judge mankind, not just the church. The church will be first, and then all mankind. So it is required to know. You want the unsaved to know. And then last, lastly, it is trustworthy, right? Now, if you have all those in place, if you keep those 10 basics about the Bible, you're going to be in really good shape when you go to interpret it. Because you're not going to think, well, this contradicts this. Or this can't be true. Or this can't be trustworthy. Or this isn't practical at all. All those things will fall away and you'll actually dig harder to understand it. Okay? Okay, let's, uh, let's go back um, what I wanted to do is, and hopefully we'll get through these tonight, um, lest this turn into a true 16-week course, which would not be good, huh? Um, four axioms. We hit axiom number one. Four axioms that if you say, I really want to do good hermeneutics, these are four basics that you want to hold on to. Number one, the Bible is God's revealed word inspired without error or contradiction. We looked at that. We'll do a very quick review in a minute. Axiom number two, the Bible is an organic, harmonious whole. It does not conflict. It is holistic. Axiom number three, the Bible is to be interpreted literally or normally. And number four, the Bible is to be understood grammatically. And Marissa, this goes back to what you were asking earlier, historically. Okay, really quickly review for axiom number one, the Bible is God's revealed word inspired and without error or contradiction. If that is true, that means it is what? If that is true, if that's a true axiom, that it is God's word, that it is without error, that it does not contradict itself, what does that tell you about its authority? It is supreme, William, that's a perfect word. There is no authority above the word of God. That means any truth claim that comes against the word of God, you know what? You know to be false. Now, I don't know about you. I, there is such a beautiful simplicity to knowing that this is God's word, and it is true, therefore, if I have a word, any word of any kind, any truth claim being made of any kind that runs contrary to the word of God, I, and it's truly contrary, now make sure it's truly contrary, then I know it cannot be true. I can say it is false, right? So, so many of the claims being made by the progressive movement today, you don't, you, you, you don't have to think at all about gender identity, or marriage. You don't, or you don't have to think about those. I'm not telling you not to, but in terms of being right or wrong, you know what the word of God says, therefore, thus saith the Lord. It's authoritative, right? No culture, no man, no president, no government can supersede the authority of the word of God if it is the word of God revealed, inspired, and without error, okay? Um, if it is God's word, that means it cannot contradict itself, why? Why can't the word of God contradict itself? Say it again, Sidney. There's one author. That author is infallible and perfect. He's not going to contradict himself. He can't contradict himself. Now, when we think there's a contradiction, it's us, not God, right? In fact, even, even human authors, for the most part, if you're a good writer, 
If you're going to write an argument, let's say for a particular class or a subject, you're probably not going to contradict yourself in your own argument. And, and you're a fallible, beautiful but fallible human being, right? I mean, most of us can write a relatively coherent argument. You're not going to begin saying, you know, I believe that abortion is murder and then end saying, I believe that abortion is a woman's right to choose. You're not going to do that. Well, if we can do, make sure we don't contradict ourselves, then certainly God will not contradict himself. Okay? Um, okay. I put that as the first axiom because that's really, we begin and we end there. If, if, we, if we miss axiom number one, then our hermeneutic is going to be bad. Right? We must believe that it is God's word and we must believe that it is without error and that it does not contradict itself. Right? Why is that so important? I mean, wh- why must that be an axiom or a pillar of your hermeneutic? How does it fall apart? Though? Yes, it does, I would agree, but how does it fall apart? What do you then begin to do? What do you do? What's that? You be, how so? Okay. Yeah. Good. So your, your testimony will fail. William? Yep. We all lie. Sometimes we'll tell people things that they don't believe. God is not a man. He doesn't lie ever and ever. So we can depend on that. Good. That word and, and others to get their way. So we can stand we have something to stand on that's unshakable. Good. 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 Brandon? Lori and I were in Los Gatos Thursday, walking by St. Luke's Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church is an absolute biblical nightmare today. Nightmare, I mean that literally. They, they take this. Not always, sister, not always. There was a time when the, the Episcopal Church, especially early in our country, they did not embrace what they embrace today. But for a long time, it certainly has been. And they had this flag, uh, not a flag, it was a poster, what, what do you call it, like a, a banner of some kind, and it, and it talked about everything that we would immediately read and go, oh, what about that passage? And what about that passage? In, co- in direct contradiction to the word of God. Now, every single Sunday, they go through an Episcopal liturgy, which would be very similar to an Anglican or a Catholic liturgy, and they have scripture strewn throughout. And if you, if you get a, uh, um, a well-trained Episcopal priest, he will give a homily that will be exegetically sound. And you think, well, how is that possible? How is it possible to claim that, to literally hold the Bible up in the middle of the service and say, this is the word of God, and have the entire church repeat after you and then teach the opposite. How is that possible? What's that? Yeah, so the congregation certainly would say, we either don't know what it says or we don't believe what it says. Marissa? It's a failure of number one fundamentally they'll they'll read a passage and they'll say but this is what we want the culture to tell us and they'll align with the culture and so you have to forsake this sonia playing religion yep yep yep
if you deviate, how much do you need to deviate in order to ruin everything? You don't have to very much, right? It's that one or two degrees of separation that suddenly, I mean, so if you go back and if you trace, take any denomination that we would say is no longer under the pale of orthodoxy, and you see where they started, and we're like this, we're just like this, and then there's that small deviation, and then 100 years pass, 200 years pass, 300 years pass, and suddenly you're going, they're no longer, we would no longer identify them as a Christian church. Right? Sydney? Then to you. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other side. I like the dark side. Yes, you're right, brother. So I'm so thankful you brought that up. Those who will perpetuate teachings that are in contradiction to the word of God are not stupid people. They may be, but, but the ones, when we're talking about the theology that's been developed through several denominations that we would no longer say are walking the, the, the narrow line of the gospel in accordance with scripture, um, going to Germany and studying under the progressive liberal theology of the Germans there used to be a joke years ago that you would go into seminary. If you were Southern Baptist, you'd go, into, you'd go to seminary as a Southern Baptist and you'd come out a Presbyterian. Or you'd go into a Christian seminary and you'd come out a Buddhist. right? Because exposure at times, if you're not going to hold firm to the Word of God, if, you've, if you violate axiom number one, then of course the deviation becomes rapid. And so a four-year seminary degree, you'll enter one way and you will leave another. And so a brilliant, I don't know who it is, but if, if he's teaching at Southern and going over and studying in Germany, you know, he's probably reading guys like, like Schleiermacher and Moltmann and I mean, some brilliant minds. And that's, that's why it's so dangerous, right? Because they're not stupid people and they write really, really well. I remember years ago when I first read, Jürgen Moltmann was a, um, a, uh, a theologian in the 1960s who he wrote a lot of uh, uh, liberation theology, which has a lot to do with um, the primary purpose of, of the gospel is to liberate people from social constraints and economic constraints and, and suffering in the world. And he wrote a book called, he wrote two. Um, uh, one was The Crucified God. And um, I remember reading it the first time and I was so compelled by it because he talks about the father suffering on the cross and there was so much to it that, that was appealing emotionally. And as I was reading, though, I was really convicted. And I thought, there, there are pieces of this that seem to be violating my understanding of the Trinity. And then went back to one of my professors, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely heretical. <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, but but it, was, it sounded so good and so brilliant and high-minded. And it was just wrong, right? So we want to, we want to be beautifully simplistic in our understanding of basic Biblical truths. And you want to hold on to those. And if you know that's what the Bible says, do not let go of it. No matter how many PhDs someone has after their name. Okay? Okay, so we can't forsake number one or it all goes bad. Axiom number two, the Bible, the biblical canon is an organic, harmonious whole. Now, when we say that, what, what are we saying? What do we mean by that? That it's an organic, harmonious whole. Oh, I need to find out where I am on this. Oh, we did that already. Okay, well, we'll get that. What, when we say it's a whole, what do we mean? It's all between two covers. It's complete, good, yes. Okay, so it has, remember we talked about unification of purpose, the glorification of God, good. 
Are you quoting something from a movie? Isn't that something from a movie? It, okay, it sounds like something from a movie. Uh, that would not be beyond you, Brandon. One message, one purpose. It is consistent from beginning to end, right? And it makes sense, right? We already said we, it's one author, right? And he's going to write it without contradiction. And so the storyline from beginning to end, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, it is the same storyline from beginning to end. And, and I think, I don't know, if I wasn't here for it. I was babysitting. But when Kirk talked about um, one of the aspects of our apologetics for the Word of God, it is unlike any other book. It's just so extraordinary in so many ways, but one of which is its consistent narrative throughout. I mean, multiple authors, 1,500 years, different languages, and, and yet you get the same story again and again and again, which makes sense because it is divinely inspired. Okay? Okay, so how many of you heard the, the phrase analogy of faith? Analogy of faith. Okay, that's a, a reform slogan, a reform term. Um, it's a real simple doctrine. It means... When, when, you, when someone says to you, what is your primary hermeneutic? If they ask you that, you should say, well, that's a great question. <laughs> they say, what's your number one tool in your, in your tool belt when you approach the word of God? You'd be safe to say analogy of faith. And if they understand that, that'd be impressive too. The analogy of faith is it's simple. It says that we will use scripture to interpret scripture. Very basic, right? I'm going to use the Word of God to interpret the Word of God. That is your number one tool. You have other tools, lots of other tools, but your number one tool when it comes to hermeneutic is the analogy of faith. Um, that term became very popular during the Reformation because we know leading up to the Reformation, especially during the medieval, Brandon, for you, you're welcome. During the, the, the mystical period, you know, post-Constantine up to the Reformation, a lot of teachings that made their way into the Catholic Church were not based upon the Word of God, or at least not a good interpretation of the Word of God. Lots of stuff came in. Do you, do you have, give me some ideas of some of the stuff that came in during the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church, for those of you who know Catholicism. We talked about one the first night. Yes, penance, penance, yeah. The, yes. Purgatory, yeah, purgatory is, that's right, that's 8th century. Mother Mary. Mother Mary, yeah. I thought that was a pop song, wasn't that? Transubstantiation, that's right. Real body, real blood. All those things came during a time when the church deviated. Now remember, the, the early Catholic church was very biblical, the early Catholic Church is very biblical. In fact, most of the creeds that we, we know and we love came out of the early Catholic Church. But for about, uh, what, uh, 1,100 years, worldly teachings were then commingled. And we talked about, um, with Pergamum, we talked about the problem of syncretistic worship. Well, that's the same thing with theology. Syncretistic theology is when biblical theology is commingled with worldly theology. And suddenly they're, they're intertwined in such a way that we're like, is that, is that right? Does that make sense? Um, and of course, the answer then is what? Analogy of faith. Well, let's go back to the Bible and see if that's what it really says. And a good theologian will stand there. So why, I know I'm going to deviate a little bit, why does the Catholic Church then argue for these things? Why do Catholic theologians argue for these things? Tina. There's something um, in a lot of ways the, 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 the religion over, like, it, it has become its own little institution. It's a little bit like, if you've ever done yoga, you know, like the various retreats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So you're, you're using the term religion. So um, what's sola scriptura mean? You say, I don't know. I don't speak Latin. Why would you ask? Say it in English. So coming out of the Reformation, what are the five solas? We were going to actually do banners of the five solas. Remember that? What are your five solas? Do you know what they are? Sola means only, right? Or alone. Sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. Faith alone. <laughs> that became a, a Peanuts cartoon there for a minute, you know? Remember the parents? Sydney, give me a third. I can't hear, sorry. Yes, grace alone. <laughs> I don't know, what do I have in my fingers here? Scripture, faith. Grace. Glory. Yes. Yes, Christ alone. The Reformation, so Martin Luther hung his hat, believe it or not, on this one. Of the five solas, he says there's going to be one sola that you don't want to miss. It's this one because this one tells the other four solas. Scripture alone. Sola Scriptura. So the reasons that... Get, go ahead, Brian. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think you probably didn't want to ask those questions. No. Um, the, that, that was one of the, the chief prizes of Reformation. It was justification by faith. The one I'm asking was, who had the ultimate authority? It was, it was the church and the Pope were the God's word. Good. So if we use the word tradition with a capital T as opposed to a lowercase t, which we would talk about in a Greek Orthodox sense, a Catholic will tell you today, it's not sola scriptura. Flat out. No problem with that. It's scripture plus the teachings of the popes and the councils for the last 2,000 years. So tradition they will say, they'll say theologically that they are equal, but in truth, it's capital T tradition that supersedes Scripture. So if you go to a Catholic church, you say, I want to become a, a catechumen. I don't think, know if they use that term still today. It's uh, the RCIA, the right, RC, right Christi Christian initiation of adults. They will hand you a catechism. You'll say, where's my Bible? I say, don't need your Bible, read your catechism, right? And so this will supersede this. Then you're going to grab a Bible, and if you're like me, you're going to, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't reconcile these two, you've got to help me, right? And they'll tie it into a passage or a verse somehow, loosely. Um, so when we interpret Scripture, this in, in, under this axiom of believing that it is a harmonious whole, we do not go outside of Scripture to understand Scripture in terms of its real meaning. It doesn't mean that we dismiss the councils. We love the councils, right? The councils actually gave shape to our understanding of the Trinity. And the councils gave shape to our understanding of, of Jesus Christ being what? What, is, what do we talk about? The hypostatic union of Christ. He is Truly God, truly man, simultaneously. So the councils fleshed all this out from Scripture. But we always go back to Scripture as the means by which these theologies and doctrines were established, right? Where it gets ugly for traditions like, or denominations like Catholicism or Greek Orthodoxy, is the tradition would be used to interpret Scripture. Now you're in trouble. I mean, you're just flat out in trouble. If your tradition or doctrine or practice is not going to come from Scripture, but it's established and then goes back into Scripture, now you're eisegeting. Remember that term, eisegesis? That's when you're reading into the text rather than extracting exegesis out of the text. Okay? Yep. Correct. Oh, yeah. 
Well, so let, let's, what's my time like? No, no, oh, no, 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 sister, that is not in response to, I just want to know if I want to deviate here a little bit. Um, the, what's the primary argument when we say sola scriptura? What's the primary argument with that? If you're a philosopher, you would say, we use scripture to interpret scripture. And when scripture is difficult, we use scripture to interpret that. They'll say what? And actually, the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church will say tradition is used to check this. It's circular reasoning, isn't it? I mean, circular reasoning. You're telling me you're going to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Well, that's circular. What is the other source? What's the outside source to check Scripture? And, of course, the answer is there can't be. It's the Word of God. Right? So it is circular, and we want to keep it circular because any other source outside the Word of God is not the Word of God. Right? I mean, that's, that's simple. The philosopher will hate that, though. They will say that's not going to be appropriate. You have to, right? Otherwise, you're going to hold everything. You're going to hold that. That's exactly right. You have to. How, in the Catholic Church, how does tradition get above Scripture? What's the process? Like, do they believe that tradition is God-inspired? Yes. I mean, how do they weigh that greater than Scripture? Yeah. Um, in terms of the Pope, you mean? In Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's very popular in the Greek Orthodox Church as well. Um, I, I will speak to the question in the Catholic Church. Um, early on in Catholic mysticism, they came up with a doctrine known as papal infallibility. And so when the Pope speaks in the Catholic Church, when he speaks what's called ex cathedra or from his throne, um, he is speaking as his title is identified as the Vicar of Christ. So he speaks as Christ on earth. Well, if he's Christ on earth speaking ex cathedra, then what he says is what? It is infallible. And you got a word. So it's not, so Catholic, capital T tradition, and I, I mean that, these are doctrinal statements made either by the Pope speaking ex cathedra or by councils. They would say is equal to, in many cases, greater than because it's infallible too. So it's a much bigger word. Does that make sense? Correct. And so, the, uh, very unwisely, they said, well, there is a woman. She's a mother of God, the mother of Jesus. And I don't think they meant it. I don't think, I honestly believe that, I don't think they meant to, to get down that road. But that was the result of that, right? They, they were trying to reach a people, and they very unwisely appealed to their, their, their like, the way that they understand the Yep. And now we have Mary, who's, you know, so a lot of what's hap happening in Catholic history is in response to the insult of catechism. A lot of people are pursuing it. Yeah, there's context for it all, right? Every single, and we would say there's context for uh, the, the shaping of theology in the context of the church as well. Um, the key for us, hermeneutically, is to say whatever the contextual movements are, for any people group at any point in time in church history, it cannot contradict God's word. And when it does, at any point in time before Christ comes again in glory, you can know for certain it is wrong, if it is truly in contradiction. So the idea of the bodily assumption of Mary or the immaculate conception of Mary, the, there's a term, uh, an idea in the Catholic Church called co-redemptrix. So Mary saves you with Christ. All those are aberrations of of theology that, that became equal to or greater than the word of God itself, right? I mean, so <laughs> my wife and I were married at Queen of the Apostles. Well, who do you think the Queen of the Apostles is? Well, that's Mary. And we went back, I don't know how long ago, it was after our marriage, and <laughs> we walk in and there is a, a great, larger than the cross statue of Mary on the stage. And I thought, wow, 
If that's not a graven image on the altar. Oh, yeah, Immaculate Conception. Mm. Yeah. So context will shape these things, but we always go back again and again. Analogy of faith means we're going to use sola scriptura. Okay, so let me give you an example of this really quickly. Let's go to, um, let's go to James chapter 2. Let's go to James chapter 2. Some of you are going, oh, I know what you're going to do here. James chapter 2. The book of James, if you've studied it, um, or if you've even read through it, maybe even a cursory faction, there are certain verses in there, especially in chapter 2, where you go, hmm, hmm. In James chapter 2, James, we believe, we believe, I believe it to be the brother of Jesus who's writing this. He's struggling with this teaching on faith and works in the context of the gospel. And we get to, well, let me just read to you. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, but you can follow on the ESV, it's fine. Uh, beginning at verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? And you stop and say, I thought it was salvation by grace through faith alone. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And you say, wait a minute, what's wrong with this? Are you struggling at all? Go back just to 21. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous, justified? Same word in the Greek that you're going to see in Galatians. For what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. What's the tension? Do we know the tension? What is the apparent tension? And there, it's not... So to show you how much brilliant minds will struggle with this, Martin Luther, <laughs> Martin Luther took the book of James and in his German translation, he put it in the appendix. That's how much James bothered him. He said it was part of the canon. He didn't take it out, but he goes, I'm going to throw it in the appendix of my Bible, which is really kind of funny. What does it sound like he's saying? Or what does he literally say in verse 21? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous, declared righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? For what he did, Sonia. Doesn't it? The righteousness of Abraham was a result of his works, which was attempting to sacrifice Isaac. Huh. Yes. Correct. So to show you how difficult this has been, every single works-based, I will say a cult because if it's works-based, it's not Christian. From Catholics to Mormons to Jehovah's Witnesses, every single offshoot of Christianity latches on to James chapter 2 and they say this is what it says so you must pervert your hermeneutic do you see the problem here you're the one twisting it James the brother of Jesus said specifically divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit that righteousness can be obtained through some good work Don't ask yourself, what do I do to be saved? You ask yourself, 
yourself um, you like if you have to go back to it like the story of Abraham like there's a story of Abraham mm -hmm. actually you what is what is its purpose like you have to take it in context because it is like it's all it's like um, all of it is true and it does mm -hmm. so we're going to say it's not in contradiction so it's got to fit do this for me. Go to Romans chapter 4. Let's go to Romans 4. And you're going to say, well, doesn't Romans 4 contradict James 2.21? He does, but he sounds very different than our brother James. Romans chapter 4. Um, let's, pick up, let's pick up at verse 1. Romans 4, verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham was justified by works, which is what it sounds like James said. He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him, verse 4, as a gift. But as an obligation, however, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And you say, now that sounds more like my, my salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. But you have the two together, and you've got to figure them both out. Okay? And so we fall back on, remember the axiom number two is that it is a harmonious whole okay so we know that james cannot be saying well what he can't be saying that you can be saved there are two ways of salvation that could be way one way you approach it there are two ways to be saved saved by grace through faith and saved by good works maybe right but if we if we use the analogy of faith and sola scriptura and then i would even argue the context of james what's going to happen What's going to happen to your rendering of this? Um, I know it's late, so let me just tell you. <laughs> so in Romans chapter 4, it's the exact same word in the Greek. This term righteousness or being justified. It means having a right or just or not guilty standing before the holy God. Okay, Same word, so it's not a different word. It's not even a different meaning, actually. But what is Paul talking about and what is James talking about? Paul's talking about your standing before God, being justified before the righteousness of God. But not so much James. Did you notice what James was talking about? What, what is James talking about in the context of faith? I need to go back there, sorry. In the context of faith and deeds. The fruit. Go ahead, Cindy. Yeah. It talks about faith. Like the testing of your faith. That's exactly right. And then um, you know, and, and then chapter two and then chapter three, um, it reads about the use of the tongue. That's right, that's right. So it's basically like, you know, faith that the faith uh, the fruit of faith. That's right. So in Romans chapter 4, Paul's talking about justification, our righteousness, and our standing before God. James is talking about the relative comparison between men. How do you know your faith's real? You claim Christ, I claim Christ. You have no fruit, I have fruit. And the justification is one that is displayed man to man, not before God. So it's not even the same type of, same word, but not the same audience. James is talking about a faith that reveals itself in good works. And this is how we'll know. So we go back to scripture and we say, well, there are several passages, we know there are several passages that will not allow us to argue a works-based salvation. We know that, okay? So it can't mean that. And then when we read chapter one and we read chapter three and we put it into context, 
We say, oh, well, of course, he's talking about a works that bears fruit and a justification, a righteousness that's revealed man to man. I can know you're a Christian because in your faith you're doing these things. And, of course, we say that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So no contradiction. Same word, poor Luther. Now, now Luther, he, it's, Luther was a master exegete. He did not, not understand it, but in light of his movement against the Catholic Church, which taught, which teaches, <laughs> salvation by grace through faith and works, he, he, got, he said, I, got, I, don't want you, I don't want you reading this. We'll do James you know, in another hundred years. So for him, it was a contextual issue historically. Brandon? Yes. That's exactly right. That's right. Lots of, in Scripture we have, is that me? No. Okay. All right. So here's a rule for you under axiom number two. It's a nice rule. This is one you want to put in your toolbox and never let it go. You want to interpret difficult passages with clear passages. <laughs> Super simple. You got a hard passage, and there are several in the Bible. You say, I, I want to interpret this well using the analogy of faith. Scripture will interpret Scripture. Scripture alone. I'm not going to go to an outside source. I'm not going to turn to church tradition. I'm not going to look at some mystical interpretation from the Middle Ages. I'm going to go back to the Word of God, and I'm going to use clear teachings passages, verses to illuminate this hard one. And I would say that James chapter 2 is a bit challenging, especially if you read it in the original language, because it does sound in part like he's attaching our justification before God to our works, but in fact he's not. And we know that because when we read the rest of the New Testament and the entire story of the Old Testament, we know it's salvation by grace through faith, therefore it can't mean that, right? We use all those other clear passages to interpret the harder ones. Okay? That's a great tool. It's just a great tool. Do that, and you'll be in good shape. Um, second thing for you will be deriving meaning from most of our teachings, our doctrines, come from passages that are holistic as well. So the reason that you can misinterpret James 2 is in part because you're not going to read James 1 or 3, 4, and 5. But when you do, the, the meaning of James and works and faith and fruit is developed completely. And so an, another rule for you, so when we talk about it being holistic, wow, that's a much better pen. We want to talk about a literary whole, right? So when you're reading in the context of the passage or the chapter or the book, um, we want we want our, our principles or our doctrines to come out of it holistically. And um, I would say we, we, we did some joking around last time, but it's really not very funny when we have all these little placards of passages and they're stripped out of their context. They can mean lots of things, right? Um, in fact, if you, if you took James 2.21 and put it onto a placard and you say, what does that mean? You say, I can work my way to heaven. You can say, I, I can get there. Right? We don't, we don't want to do that. Um, why, why? Go ahead, Cindy. Oh, okay. Um, I thought it was like one of those low, hey, I got something, Pastor. <laughs> low question. I like that. Um, why is it so easy? Why is it so easy today to make these, the really basic hermeneutical errors for us? I mean, we see it all the time. We hear it a lot. We hear, I mean, Gavin Newsom had billboards 
in other states with Scripture justifying a woman's right to kill her child. Well, that's, that's pretty extreme. And yet there are churches who say, yes, we agree. Why, are we, why is it so much harder today in light of all that we have? I mean, you, you've got tools. You've got free tools at your fingertips, literally at your fingertips, that much of the church did not have for 2,000 years. And yet, go, no, go ahead. That's a good point, yeah. And, yeah. Um, you, you also, everything you say can be sent off in millions of people in, in seconds. Yeah. And so, in a way, <coughs> that, is really, that is really grieving because back in the day before all of this, if you were a false teacher, yeah, you might, you know, there's the extremes where um, people might give Good. Brand? Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it, it's, so much, it's so much easier that way. We don't, we don't want to do the hard work of actually looking at Scripture. We want to see, you know, not just thinking God's love, but, oh, he loves the world. No one's going to be judged for me. Oh, that's easy. Good. We can pull something out. We like what it sounds. We're not, we want to read it as it's intended to be. Read. Okay, so that's the third aspect here is that we don't use the context of Scripture. And we're going to talk more about this. I'm going to give you some a literary tool and historical tools, but if, if we read out of context, it's easy to misinterpret. It doesn't matter what you're reading, Bible or anything else. Um, if you read something out of context or you're not reading it carefully. Go ahead, Lori, and then Marissa. Oh, I was going to say willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. That's hurtful. <laughs> Meaning what? I'm intentionally being stupid? So a lot of a, a lot of the a lot of the false teachings are very very attractive yeah. Yeah, they, they to the flesh, yeah. to the flesh, very attractive. So willful ignorance, good, I would agree. If we believe in the analogy of faith, and that is scripture interpreting scripture, and we believe sola scriptura, scripture alone, then the number one reason we misinterpret scripture is because we don't know the scriptures. We know some scripture but we don't know a lot of scripture or we don't have a holistic picture of scripture. Now it's very, this is, when someone first comes to a saving grace in Christ, it's a very dangerous time for them. That first couple years, especially if they're not putting in the time because they're getting truth and simultaneously Satan would love nothing more than to derail them, right? And it's not until you begin to acquire a truly holistic picture of the word of God so that when you hear it, the false teaching you know. You don't even know why you know, but you know. You're like, that smells bad. That looks bad. And someone will say, well, give me a verse. Give me a passage. I say, I don't know. I don't know. But I know enough of my Bible to know that's not going to fit. And that's where you want to be. Your, your greatest weapon against a bad hermeneutic is knowing the Bible well. So that means reading it, that means meditating on it, that means studying it, that means doing things like this, listening to sermons, listening to teachings. Right? You just want to get a, a much more, think about, think about when you first came to a saving grace in Christ if you, were not, if you were not raised in the church or you were raised in a church that did not teach it well. I mean, you're just, you, you know so little, right? You're like, just this, it's like this, oh man. You know God's real, you know your sin's real, you know Christ is your savior, you've repented and you believed, but it doesn't go much beyond that. And then you start trying to get these bits and pieces. Remember early on, I, I was in the Catholic church for six, seven years and it was a mess and I was confused and I came here and it wasn't great teaching here and I'm still confused, right? But after a while, as I kept reading and studying and pieces kept dropping in, and then that biblical worldview that we talk about starts to get solidified and begins to grow and grow and grow 
And then all those weird false teachings, they really don't have any entry point anymore, right? And, and we, we, we want to spend our whole life doing that, working really hard for the rest of our lives, growing in the wisdom and knowledge of God so there's no entry points because they're out there and they're, they're um, to the flesh, they're delicious. And I want to latch on to those, right? So do you remember that? Do you remember? You say, I'm still there. No, I, you know you're not. You're not. I know you're not. Most of you are very well along. Yeah? Okay. Um, what time do we have? Oh, we're at it. We're at it. 816. Okay. So uh, we will we'll pick up on axiom. Let's, let me try this. Axiom number three. Census literalis. A little more Latin for you. You like that? That was Luther's also. You know what that means? Guess what it means. The literal sense. The literal sense of the word. We'll talk about this. The Bible to be interpreted literally or normally. Um, this is a hard one. Uh, usually when, we, when you hear the word, oh, are you interpreting that literally, someone is saying to you what? It's not a compliment most of the time. They're saying... What's the, what's, the, what's the derogatory term attached to it? Are you a, starts with an F. Are you a fundamentalist? Uh, a biblicist, yes. Are, are, do you believe that it actually says what it says? And the answer to that is yes and no. Yes, and I believe in the normal interpretation of the word of God, and no as to how you are interpreting I believe in the normal interpretation of the word of God. Okay, so you will be a, a, a normalist. We'll use that term. It's a little bit better. I'm a normalist. Okay. All right, any questions? I know we, uh, we didn't get anywhere near as far as I would have liked, so I apologize. Um, questions? Axiom one, axiom two. Axiom number one is what? This is part of retrieval. You know, retrieval is one of the best ways to, to increase your long-term retention. You know that? Scientifically proven, by the way. You do. You have these uh, little synaptic neurons that begin to lay roads up on your your cerebral cortex, it's fantastic. Biologically changing when you retrieve things. So let's retrieve it. Axiom number one, do I have it up there? I don't, good. Axiom number one, Sonia. The divinely inspired, revealed word of God without error or contradiction. Axiom number two. <laughs> Did you look at your notes, Mark? <laughs> Organic? Harmonious? whole right all right you're not doomed yes you can we'll help you remember let's pray father we are so thankful for our time tonight and i'm um, just looking at these uh, real fundamental tools that you've given us to understand your word um i pray that you would help my brothers and sisters remember um if, if we do father if even with these first two, if, if we truly believe that your word is divinely inspired and without error or contradiction and we truly believe that the Bible is a harmonious whole and, and cannot um, work against itself, um, then we will be in a great position to interpret your word well. Um, I pray, Lord, that we would use the analogy of faith, um, that we would interpret scripture with scripture. And, and because of that, Father, I pray we would learn scripture. We'd learn it well, Father, that we would, we would look at passages like Matthew chapter 10 and really work hard to understand what it means to love Christ most, even at the, at the potential cost of broken relationships in our own family. Um, we want to understand these things, Father, so that we might know you, um, that we might love you, um, and that we might be obedient in following Jesus. Um, we're thankful that you've given us um, a means by which to know you through your word. I pray that we'd practice and we would practice well for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.